Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. Hey everybody, welcome to the 120th Fireside Chat. Today we're going to be talking to ultra runner Rachel Bambrick. Rachel is the founder of Women in Ultra Running. It's an organization with the goal of making long distance ultras less intimidating for women through building community. Rachel is also an accomplished long distance athlete of her own, finishing a 200 mile run in Haiti, as well as finishing the 2023 version of Coca Dona 250, which we will be chatting about for sure. Rachel is fairly new to running, having moved to Philadelphia and joining the sport in 2016, trying to make friends like most of us do with these sports. On Thursday, here's a note for uh, our Everyday Athlete Podcast Network. On Thursday at 6 p.m., the Beyond the Finish Line podcast will be live with guest Chris Morrison. Make sure to join us then uh, as host Joe Harden will be uh, interviewing Chris for his ninth episode of Beyond the Finish Line. Also on our YouTube channel, The Running Tale Show with Craig Lewis from this morning is available. Craig's guest was Jake Griggs, and it is a fascinating conversation. So without further delay, let's bring Rachel on to the show and talk more about ultra running and women ultra running. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey, Jason, I'm doing well. How are you? Fantastic. Now that I get to talk to you for the next 30, 40 minutes. I'm excited too. I appreciate your time. So in the intro, I, I mentioned that you moved to Philadelphia in 2016 and got into running to make friends. Um, was that the only catalyst for getting into running? Were you, were you running where you previously lived and you needed, you were looking for friends or were you looking to get into the sport brand new in 2016? Yeah, I think, um, running had always been something that I did to like stay in shape for something else. So I grew up, um, until I got to college, I danced competitively. So you do some cardio to stay in shape for that. Um, in college I played on our ultimate Frisbee team. So again, Ran a little bit, was active, um, but running was never the primary like sport or athletic thing I was doing. Moved to Philly, played a little bit of Frisbee, wasn't feeling like I wanted to stay competitive with that and was looking for a way to stay active and meet people. And Philly has such a vibrant um, like run club scene and run community that started going to one and you meet someone there, they tell you about their club and then all of a sudden you're involved in five or more clubs. So it was a great way to meet people in a big city where it can be hard to feel like you have that community. So while Philly can be very big, the, the run community makes it feel pretty close knit and small, which is great. So we're, we're gonna talk about women in ultra running uh, eventually, but did you get started in road running and then find your way to ultra running or were you straight into ultra and trails? Yeah, it definitely started with um, road running. I signed up for my first half marathon um, the end of 2016 with some friends from college. So we went and did the, it's no longer in existence, but the rock and roll Brooklyn half. So that was my first exposure into that. And then I think about a month or two later, I did the, the Philly half. So definitely got hooked pretty quickly. Um, I think it took a little while to get more into the trail running. I'd done a marathon or two. Uh, there's a great group here in Philly called Chasing Trail that runs on some trails in the Wissahickon. So came out with them a little bit. And I think for me, it just snowballed. You just hear people who are going on these amazing adventures. Like they run a marathon and then you hear about, well, what are trail marathons? What are ultra marathons? And I'm very curious about all of those things. So I definitely just kept ticking those boxes until I really found my love in the sport in ultra running, but it took a little while to get there. What's the, what was the thing about road running first, and we'll talk about trail running second, that you were like, okay, I did this Brooklyn half, now let me do this other half, and now let me do this other half. Like, was it, I, I really enjoyed myself and I want to be better and see if I can be faster, or I really enjoyed the training and, and you know, why not cap it off with uh, a race? Like, what was the catalyst that kept you going uh, from half marathon to half marathon back then? I think I just like challenging myself and seeing how far I can go. And I think, again, that's probably why I got into ultra running, but it is just cool to see when you think there's no way I could finish a half marathon. Like you think 
13 miles is so far and it is far. finish that. And you're like, well, okay, marathons exist. How? So I, I always had that question after pretty much every race of like, well, what else is out there? Or if it's not a local marathon, what's a marathon I could do where I get to see some really beautiful sights and go on an adventure. So I think that version of pushing myself, I'm not the fastest runner. That wasn't what enticed me into the sport with how go or what, what adventures can I take myself on? What's the best place you've run a road event at? Hmm. A road event. I feel like my favorite road event experience, um, the Philly Marathon has, you can, they have three races their weekend. So they have a half marathon, an 8K and a full marathon. And a few years ago, they have a challenge where you can do all three. So that was a really fun adventure. It wasn't, you know, it, they weren't sites that I don't normally see running in Philly all the time, but just just being part of that energy and that crowd support in every single race was a really unique way to experience it. I don't know if I need to do it again because I really do like cheering and being a part of the weekend in a different capacity. But it was a really a really cool experience to do and to say, you know, I've done that like very Philly kind of challenge. <laughs> yeah, the Philly half I think was my second half marathon because I was born and raised in New York, and I did a Westchester half, and then I did um the philly half as my second one and it was an experience you know running down by the and i'm gonna butcher this the skokiel river i think is how you pronounce it um close. but it was Google, <laughs> but super close <laughs> it's hard. um it was an experience and, and to your point like there's so much out there right that going back to do the race would be cool but it's probably not priority um which leads me to getting into the trail running so you're doing this half marathon, you're doing this road running. What is it that you see um, that says, hey, let's just go try this trail thing. Let's see what that's all about. I I really think it's the adventure of it. I like to, I mean, I'm, I'm born and raised in the East Coast. I've lived here all my life. And so many of these trail races, I think, are really enticing. I've gone out West a lot. I've seen so many beautiful sights. And I think the special thing about a lot of these trail races, no matter where you are, you're often getting yourself somewhere on foot that you maybe wouldn't really be able to see otherwise. It's like maybe it just it would have been too long of a hike or it's too I, I love the the feeling in that moment when you get yourself to this this beautiful vista that's maybe like 13 miles from the trailhead and you're like, wow, this this is a tough spot to get to on foot, but I was able to do that and have this experience, you know, through my own body and my own power. So you find trail running, does trail running automatically just lead you into ultra running then and, and going past the marathon distance or um, was it a buildup? Okay, I'm going to do a half on the trail, then a full on the marathon on the trail. And now let's go to the 50k or further distance. It, so I did a trail marathon in, in Ithaca, New York. That's where I went to college. Um, um, that was brutal because Ithaca is quite hilly. And that I'd had thoughts or ideas about I'd watched her do that and I'd watched her take on the training. I'd, I'd run with her a little bit and gotten to know her better through that. And it's, I always describe it as I get that like itch in my brain. And when you have that big project or that thing, you just know it's so scary and daunting, but I can't stop thinking about it. The run across Haiti was that for me. So to, I think to more to prep myself for that, I figured let's try a trail marathon. Let's try things that are just a little bit more and more out of my comfort zone to see if I'd feel ready to take this on. Um, and then in 2019, I, I did that run in Haiti and that was my first ultra because embedded within that, there are some days that are sub ultra distance, like one day is a 13 mile day, but then there are some days that are huge. Like you have a 34 mile day, a 52 mile day, all of my first ultras kind of embedded in that one. So I think that it, it was just that the big
got me towards um, or from more traditional distances and trail running. Do you ever think about going back to road running and shorter distances? Um, not really. <laughs> I think I, I prefer the further ones. I think I've only ever just continued to see what I can do that's further versus shorter. Um, I still, like when I'm not in a big tra training cycle for an ultra, I'll do some shorter runs or in a workout and work on speed, but it's, it's not what gets me excited about running. So, so not anytime soon. <laughs> so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, one of them is what type of race do you prefer um, and why? And it is, you know, clearly you mentioned going longer, um, but why is it because it's a challenge or you get to see more things or what's the um, rationale for why going longer? Um, I think it's the challenge of it. I think I really like to see who I become when I get to that place. I think so many of us have experienced that in ultras. And I think especially the like hundred or hundred plus mile distance, you, you really learn a lot about yourself and who you become in some of those tough moments. And I always think it's, I come to that from a very like a place of, of definite privilege where I'm I'm lucky in my day to day life. I don't experience a lot of those those you know strong feelings of like hardship or adversity. So being able to challenge myself and and see who I become in those moments and it really teaches me a lot about myself that I'm able to bring back to my day to day life. That when you know some of those more minor inconveniences honestly pop up, I feel like I'm able to handle them with a little bit more grace because I've learned. I can struggle through something really difficult. I can struggle through something really hard and keep going. So I think those longer and longer distances start to teach me that about myself, which I think is really important and helps me be a better person when I go back to just a little bit more of the monotony of day-to-day -day life when you get back from some of those ultras. So you finished uh, the 200 mile race in, in Haiti um, and then you decide to register for Cocodona two vastly different scenarios, right? One is a stage race, various different distances on various system day, different days. And now one's going to be continuous multi-day race. Um, why, why leave the stage race and go to the multi-day event like Cocodona? What was the draw um, that Cocodona presented to you that you were like, register? Um, yeah, I think it, it was definitely a, a gradual build. I um, I finished the 2019 run across Haiti and then was registered to do that in 2020. And everyone knows what happened with 2020. So we didn't go back. Um, and then unfortunately, since then, we haven't been able to go back, but it just hasn't been quite safe enough for us to return to Haiti. So I really had to stop and think, what, like, do I want to continue with ultras at this point? Like, it really had been the drive was that specific run. Um, and then thinking about, well, what could I do here more stateside or more locally? So I did my first 100, um, pretty local to uh, Philadelphia. Then at that point, I think that was 2021. So I'd watched that inaugural year of Cocodona. I now found out that you're part of, and I watched that live stream, <laughs> yes, and was just like, just so wrapped into that. I remember watching Maggie finish and just, I was glued to it. And I really didn't know anything about distance. I didn't even know 200 milers were a thing, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. The course just looks so beautiful. The coverage that Arabipa does is just incredible. Um, so then I, I had it that itch in my brain. So it was stuck there. I kept thinking about it. Um, I talked to my coach about 2022, if he thought I would be ready, I'd worked with a coach to train for my first hundred. And I was kind of told like, 
I could go for it if I wanted to, but if I really wanted to have the most successful race I could to continue to train through 2022 and then see if I still wanted to go for it in 2023. So that's exactly what I did. Took on some more races, um, just really continued to hone in on ultra running and then hadn't stopped thinking about it. So end of 2022, reached back or, you know, talked to my coach about it again and got the got the go ahead of, you know, it's going to be tough, but I think it's, we're in a better place to make it a more successful race. So that was kind of the progression towards, towards that in 2023. But I just think Herviper does such a good job of showcasing their races. And I could not stop thinking about it after I saw that first live stream in 2021. For everybody who says marketing doesn't work, it clearly does. <laughs> yes. I'm a sucker for a good race video. <laughs> <laughs> Let, we'll, we'll talk more about Cocodona in a moment, but I want to talk about the training leading into it. So you, you're training for hundreds and now you're training for 250. You've already run across 8200. Was the training that much different between training for a hundred miler versus Cocodona and 250 miles? Not a whole ton. I think, um, and I think that's something I really try to emphasize to folks, you, you know, even jump from marathon distance to maybe a 50 K or 50 miler, the, the training doesn't increase that much because like, as you know, we can only ever run so much during the week when we all have lives and other responsibilities. I think the biggest difference is where we had some much longer, like back to back days, um, doing some like one or two more overnight runs. And then another big one was really just doing a lot more of my long runs at what we'd call like 200 mile effort, which for me is, you know, about 50% running and 50% hiking. So it was <laughs> full pack pulls, all the gear on, like carrying that 10, 15 pound pack and run hiking. And that's been, you know, more of my speed when I'm training for those 200. So that, that speed, I think was one of the biggest differences and kind of getting in that mentality of, I, you do need to slow down. Cause if you go out guns a blazing to a 200, it's probably for most of us, not going to go super well. So really being comfortable, knowing your plan and slowing down was a big difference. hundred percent. You know, it's, it's funny because when I tell people, when I train for hundred milers, like my max volume in a week is 40 to 50 miles. And I know mm -hmm. people get up to a hundred miles plus for those things, but, um, I'm a more of a low volume, um, athlete because I'll also swim and cycle, which will help, you know, with the endurance part of it too. And, and there isn't much of a difference between hundred mile training and 250 mile training in my book either. I'm, I'm with you on that. It's, it's about the longer back to back days, um, than anything else. So I, I know I can answer this question really easily for myself, but I want to know your answer. At what point during the Coca Dona event, if you had one, were you like, holy mackerel, this is really hard, much harder than I anticipated? Yeah. Um, it's, and it's one that I've heard so many other Coca Dona runners and finishers talk about. So I'm curious if it's yours as well, but that um, the descent off of Mingus, I think is one of the hardest sections of that race that gets, I feel like it gets overlooked because you look at the climbs and you think, okay, I've got to go up however many thousand feet, that's going to be tough. And you don't think about how far a descent would be, but I think that the descent off of Mingus mountain is about, I think it's over 4,000 feet in about like 15 to 17 miles. So it's pretty steep down. It's decently technical. It's a lot of like loose, rocky sections. And I hit it in the middle of the day. It was hot. It was exposed. I kept like tripping and catching my toe on rocks. And the, that downhill can really crush your quads. And that was a moment I was also, you know, my partner was pacing me. So I felt more comfortable with him. And I just started sobbing, like just absolutely sobbing, not because anything was, you know, broken or torn. I just was, I just kept saying like, this is so hard. This is so hard, like over and over again. And I think that was a moment that was super low and very challenging, but I do think I haven't ever forgotten it because I came into that aid station in such a low spot. I thought I'm only about halfway. I've gone 125 miles. How the heck am I going to go 125 more? And I had to really stop and think like, what was my race going to be? I left that aid station and I usually am not very well fueled by like, uh, like angry energy, but I was so frustrated that I just put my head down and I ran, I think it was maybe like eight, it was a short section, maybe about eight to 10 miles next aid station. 
I was dropping like 10, 10, 30 minute miles, just cruising and all the pain in my feet went away. All of the, the, the frustration started to just like melt away. And it's been a moment that I bring with me in other ultras in just other moments in life of like, you can feel so low and like everything is impossible and everything is so hard. Like I kept sobbing, but then you can turn it right around and there's so much more within you and within all of ourselves that I don't think we always know. So lowest moment led to one of my highest moments and also just such a great lesson that I, I would never have learned otherwise. Yeah. So for me, I had the opposite reaction going down Mingus. <laughs> um, I had gotten there in the middle of the night, had two vegan dogs at the aid station up there, which were fantastic. Took a couple, three hour nap and uh, Maria Simone, my captain and pacer for that stretch, we left as the sun was coming up. Uh, there's an article on our website called um, Take a Chance. And that's a picture of me getting ready to go down Mingus as the sun was rising. It's on that article. And I flew down that section and I had a blast. Like I had so much fun going down that section. For me, the worst part, and I think it's only because it was the inaugural year and nobody knew what to expect, but going up Lane Mountain at the mm -hmm. very beginning was brutal. And I remember sitting there, a buddy of mine and I were doing the race and we had we sort of vowed to stick together until the first aid station at mile 70, 72, whatever that is. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, how am I going to tell the crew and the pacers that I'm dropping out on day one <laughs> in like the first seven hours of this event? Like, this is so hard. Um, but we made it through and, and we got through there fine. Another part that I did not enjoy at all either was when you leave Jerome, that first descent when you leave Jerome and it's like sandy and broken bottles and rocks and it's like, it's like awful. So steep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Like I slid down there a few times, you know, cause you're yeah. exhausted. <laughs> I'm like, holy macaroni, man. Like how much harder can this event really get? But <laughs> it is, it is one of those things like you mentioned earlier, like you learn a lot about yourself um, in these events and, and you go through this process of learning. Um, we have a, we have a whole bunch of questions on here. Um, one of the questions on here is, um, what would you say to someone if they wanted to get into long distance? Should they start small? Should they start at the half marathon distance, full marathon, and then work their way up? Or you know what? If you train properly, you can jump into a hundred mile, two hundred mile event. What would what would be your advice? Yeah, I think I think it it the biggest thing that should drive like what races you're choosing to sign up for, the distances we want to run should be you know, our motivation and like the why behind it. Um, I think if, you know, if we're going to take on a hundred miler, we should run over 13 miles, like a half marathon in training. But I don't think there's any reason that if you haven't raced a half marathon, you couldn't work your way up to running a hundred. If that hundred mile distance, if that ultra my ultra distance is what is driving you and you're passionate about it and you really want to do that, you can absolutely build up to that. If we're starting from not a whole ton of miles, then we may want to gradually increase that through our training. But I don't think that we need to start and work our way progressively through races. I think it's more about working your way progressively through training. And I am a huge proponent. I, I work with a coach. I've worked with them for the last three and a half years. I'm a coach myself. I think looking to coaches and mentors and people in your community to, to help with some of these things, if you're looking to make a big jump is really important. But yeah, I think if you want to go for it and that's what's important to you and a half a road, half marathon isn't going to do it, we don't need to do that necessarily. I don't think it has to be that incremental. I think you nailed it. I think it's the why. Like, why are you doing these things? What is the, the rationale for getting involved in these sports in any form or fashion? And a strong why can guide you and, and, and then understanding patience, right? To your point, if we're going from couch to 100 miles, it's going to take a little bit more time than if you have a base as a marathoner, for argument's sake. One of the things you mentioned was mentor, and that immediately made me think of your organization, uh, Women in Ultra Running. And in the introduction, I said the goal was to make long distance ultras less intimidating for women through building the community. 
when you say less intimidating, are we talking about covering the distance and or running on your own? Or, or what's the intimidation factor that you are trying to eradicate for women and get them involved in ultra and trail running? Yeah, I think it comes from, um, I think it comes from a lot of different places. So I think there's the the fact that when we, we put on our events and also we have an online community, um, they're all centered around uh, ultra running topics. So I think the sport itself can feel really intimidating just in the sense of there's so much you need to plan for and learn about and know to do. Um, like you can, you can muscle your way through a half marathon, probably even a marathon. It may not look pretty, but you could hypothetically not really fuel and just grit it out. But when we start to get to those ultra distances, you really need to know what you're doing in terms of nutrition, maybe sleep strategy, in terms of mental strategy. We may be introducing new pieces of gear like packs. And there's so much that people are just like, I don't know even where to begin. Like, how does someone even start learning about that? So I think helping to decrease like that, that barrier to entry by making it feel less intimidating, because if you come to one of our events, it's all themed around a different topic. So we will do one on let's say mental strategy, we'll go for a trail run and then we'll have a topic discussion. We'll answer questions. I'll bring in, you know, experts in my local community for our events to talk about those different things. And then we have this online platform where someone can hop back on afterwards and say, Hey, I have a question about what came up or I've been struggling on some of these long runs to keep a good mantra in my head. What should I do? Just so lowering that intimidation and that barrier to entry. I also think by creating like a community of women, um, both you know locally in Philly, and then as we start to um, continue to grow, if you go to a race and you see someone from Women in Ultra Running or someone that you've met online or in person, it helps to also lower that intimidation factor. So you know, right now there's the average for 2023 for um, female participants in ultra marathons was about 31%. So you're still going to likely, as a woman, show up to these races and see fewer people who look like you than who do. There are going to be more men there. So if you, if you have a friend or you know someone from our community there, you're going to feel more welcomed and more accepted um, within that space. Also, there's, you know, continually a lot of work to do to diversify in many other areas and also, you know, hoping to continue to try to partner with other groups to help you know, welcome women of a variety of backgrounds into the sport. So Native women, BIPOC women, um, LGBTQIA women, and making sure that we also expand that inclusion, not just to, to mean women, but all women. Um, so I think having that, and then I think having conversations, and this is an area we're looking to grow and expand in with race directors and race companies about ways that we can make ultras feel less intimidating to women, whether that's through marketing and I know personally, I am not always drawn to the toughest race out there just so I can do the toughest race. I like to know other things about it. Like, what are the beautiful vistas I'm going to see? Do we have some really cool aid stations with themes and food that are going to make it fun for me? Um, also, marketing like that you have pregnancy deferral policies, that you have period products available, considering if we look at your Instagram feed for a race, who am I seeing at the start line? Who am I seeing featured? Are we just talking about the fastest finishers? Or are we talking about the back, the mid pack? Are we really featuring everyone? So that way, when you show up to an ultra as a woman, you you feel like you're accepted and you feel like you see yourself there and are included. So I think it's two part in lowering the, the intimidation factor or that barrier to entry for how the heck do I run an ultra marathon? And then also lowering that intimidation factor of like, if I show up, am I going to be just so scared and feel like I'm the only person who looks like or feels like me at this race? So both of those things go together and through a lot of different areas and definitely still trying to balance and juggle it all right now. But those are areas we're looking to, to advocate to, to change and to help more women feel um, included. Yeah. There, there are a lot of obstacles in trail and ultra running from a physical and mental standpoint in terms of performance that the gatekeeping part of it makes it even harder. Right. And to your point, some people may not, um, purposely be gatekeeping. But to your point, if the pictures are of here are the top three finishers, here are the top three finishers, and, and there's no imagery of middle, back of the pack people, that's gatekeeping in a sense. And it, it may prevent people from registering for an event. Um, you, you mentioned potentially growing, but before we go to the, that part there, um, are you conducting um, 
trail running, you know, group runs in Philly today. And then our all people can join from all across the country and, and be part of like a Zoom conversation type of thing as well. Yeah. So um, at this point, we have our in-person events currently um, are limited to the Philadelphia area because that's where I live. And as I, I you know, I've mentioned in, to a couple different people, like I, I thought this was going to be a four part event series and it just really grew and is continuing to grow. So it started with just events locally, but um, all of our in-person events usually one about once a month. Um, and they, all of our big kind of, I'd say like maybe flagship sort of uh, events are focused around like a topic. So we meet, we do an, um, not an ultra run, we do a trail run, um, usually between like 60 to 90 minutes. And then we have a topic discussion again to to learn more about the ultra ultra world and quest, answer questions people might have. Then um, kind of happening simultaneously within that we have, it's a platform called Halo, H-E-Y-L-O, um, the links in our Instagram to, to join. People from all across the country, Philadelphia and otherwise can join this platform. So it's a community of women. I think we have about 150 people part of the um, community right now online can join and then they have access to a variety of different um, chat forums. So you can join whichever chat forums you want. We have some more local ones. So to, just to talk about Philadelphia events and then we have ones for mental strategy. We have a chat forum to find training buddies in your area. We have a chat forum to talk about races. If someone wants to know more, has anyone run this race before? What's the vibe? Am I going to like it? All of that exists there on that online platform. Um, and then we have been offering a few more virtual events as well. So open to all across the country. We have um, a series, it's every other week called Off Trail, led by two mental health therapists. And we talk about a variety of topics. Sometimes if it's a local race, we'll do a, a pre-race like mental shakeout call. We've done a call on um, menstruation and ultra running and ways to you know, just process running on your period and just different topics that kind of thread and weave within ultra running and mental health. And we're currently in the middle of a two-part series uh, virtual event on strength training for ultra running. So definitely having some virtual events going simultaneously with the in-person events. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully, I don't know the official details yet, but working on expanding to try this concept out in a few more cities. We've got a few things in the work. So I think to me, seeing the response here has been just absurd and unlike anything I could have expected. And the more I thought about it, I was like, well, if this could exist in another city, then more women in that city are going to be able to have the tools that the folks in Philadelphia do for women signing up races. And that's how you continue to like raise the tide and see more women at um, these ultra events. So it seems like it's a huge undertaking, but when I thought about it, it, it seemed to be a natural progression. So people can find you on Instagram at women in ultra running. Where else can they find you? Do you have any other areas that they can go and get more information? Yeah. Um, website is in the works and all of this to say this, I work a variety of part-time jobs and this started in January. So it's just snowballed in the best way. Um, so a lot of things are currently in the works, but best ways to find us would be Instagram at women in ultra running and then um, join us on halo. So Halo, the link will be in um, our Instagram bio, and that's where you have access, like we were talking about, to all those different chat forums. And it's, you know, we, Instagram is a wonderful community, but it, it's a big community and it can feel very transient. I think our Halo community, that's where we have about 150 members. It feels a bit more close knit and you can really get to ask some of those maybe more personal questions. You can get those deeper connections through there. That's also where we have all of our events posted. So you can register for in-person or virtual events through that. This is really cool. Um, a couple of about last week, I guess I, I interviewed Hunter Ralston, who is the founder of Women on Wheels, which is a cycling group um, that is looking to remove the intimidation factor in cycling. And so to have women in ultra running, you know, with another platform to remove um, the intimidation barriers in, in trail and ultra running is really cool. So kudos to you on getting that up and running. And um, however, Run, Drive, Bike can help. We The things that you said about inclusivity um, from BIPOC to LGBTQIA plus community is everything that I founded this business on. So whatever we can do to help you as you grow, please let me know. Um, shout out before I get into our uh, 
rapid fire food questions to Ohm and Andrew Marvin, who are racing Bigfoot 200 this upcoming week slash weekend. Speaking of ultra and trail runs, so shout out to you guys. Um, and um, it's been a fantastic conversation, Rachel, with you. And um, we look forward to sharing your information on our podcast, which you will get next Sunday. Um, for those of you who are joining now, it'll be on our YouTube channel and our website on Friday. And we'll we'll share those in our stories as well as on threads and Twitter and Facebook as well. Um, are you ready for our rapid fire food questions? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so we talked in the uh, green room that your originally out of Boston, you've lived in New York, and now you're in Philly. Which of those three places has the best pizza? Mm. Don't get this <laughs> hard question. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. I feel like it's whatever I say is going to be controversial to whoever lives. I, I'm going to say Philly because I've just, I, I've, I've lived here more. I've had more pizza here. <laughs> Please don't, no one kill me for that. Um, there's, there's. We just lost the entire New York stuff. following. <laughs> yeah, the, the live stream closes. Um, yeah, I think so far Philly, but uh, please show me otherwise or uh, places that I should get pizza at. <laughs> I will message you some. Uh, I've had great pizza in Boston and North End. Last summer was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever find your way to New York City, Tavola on 37th and 9th in Hell's Kitchen is probably my favorite place to get pizza in New York. That's not one of those pizza closets, and I call them a pizza closet. Like you walk in, it's $2.99 for two slices and a Coke, and it's just a pizza oven in there, um, but yeah. a little bit more of a fancy style pizza, uh, Tavola on 37th and 9th in Hell's Kitchen. So I we're talking pizza. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? <laughs> I do. Okay. This is, these are not rapid fire answers. Um, I, my answer is yes, but I'm like sadly somewhat allergic to pineapple. So like I can't have it, but when I have had it, I like it. So I'm going to say yes as a concept. No for me. Cause I won't feel very good. <laughs> this, this interview is not going as well as I had hoped. You didn't choose New York pizza and now you're putting pineapple on it too. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oreos. When you purchase Oreos, are you going the OG style? Are you going double stuff? You're going with this abomination they call fins or the devil dog packaged as a, what they call a cakester? Oh, um, original, but also uh, me and my friends really like to buy all of the like insane flavors that they've come out with recently. So like original, but I'll always try like carrot cake or like sour patch kit like i'll try the weird ones i won't always like them but original stuffing i will try the weird flavors have you tried the pop rocks one no what this is where you come to get the the real insight on food especially if it comes <laughs> to carbs candy and cookies yes. where we are it yes try the pop rocks one okay all right i will licorice are you a fan of licorice Yes. Black or red? Red. Red vines that or Twizzlers? Uh, Twizzlers. I, mo you know, it's interesting. More people than not have chosen red vines over Twizzlers. Huh. I, I don't know why. I, you know, for me, it's candy, so I'm going to eat it. So I'm good with yeah. it either way. <laughs> but I'm not a fan of the black. I don't, the anise flavor is not for me. Um, Peeps. Are peeps a real candy or are they just a marshmallow covered in glitter dust? <laughs> I okay. Um, I think the sec the second one. I don't I, I don't know what I would call them as a food category, but I don't think of them as candy. Yeah, there's there's some kind of marshmallow. Yeah, covered in glitter dust. They're terrible. And here's yeah, the funny thing. We've had you can be controversial here. Like, give me give me your hot food takes. It's okay. I, I, I I'm not know. a I'm not a uh, I let my hot food takes fly, although most people think they're wrong. Um, what I will tell you about peeps that we've heard, which I think is absurd, is that you should let them get stale. And my reaction has always, exactly, yes, <laughs> that face is exactly right. My so. reaction has always been, so I'm going to take something that's bad, make it worse, and somehow it's going to taste better? Like, that doesn't make sense. 
Yeah, then that's just like not a good food to start with if we have to make it go bad to be good. Yeah, something's wrong there. <laughs> candy corn. Is candy corn a real candy or is it just earwax covered in sugar? I'm going to go real candy. I do. I legitimately like candy corn. I eat the little section by section. Yeah, big fan. <laughs> You're like nibbling? Got the, yeah, yeah. Got the yellow Getting part. Color by color. <laughs> Yes. You line them up and make a wheel, like a like a Trivial Pursuit wheel, so that they're all facing, and then you pick one off at a time. Oh, well, I haven't yet, but I might have to try this. I don't buy it other than Halloween, so come October, I might have to get some and try that. <laughs> now, my eating habits when it comes to things like this are what we'll call strange. So when I eat M&Ms, like I, I align them by color, and then I eat the lowest number of colored M&Ms to the largest number of colored M&Ms. So like if there's one brown, two red, I'm eating the brown one first and then I eat the two red. Um, it makes no sense in the world. They all taste the same, but this is my move. Yep. If it works, it works. <laughs> Creamy or crunchy peanut butter or nut butter if you have allergies? Creamy. They're, that's the only answer I'll accept. <laughs> <laughs> crunchy is... No, no, the texture is wrong. <laughs> when you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, do you put peanut butter on one slice, jelly on the other, and then smash them together? Or do you put peanut butter on one slice, jelly on top of the peanut butter, and then smash the other slice over top? <laughs> the first one, the two each on a bread and then bread together. The other one's wild. I also watched my friend make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for... She wanted half and the other person wanted a half. And I watched her put jelly on half, peanut butter on half on both and then put it together. So we all were like, what is your brain doing? So um, yeah, the first one, because I think that's again, the only way to do it. <laughs> it's a lot of work. To, yes, to, it's so weird. <laughs> there's a lot of math involved there too, right? Like, okay, this half had peanut butter. So I got to make sure when I flip it over, the jelly smashes on top of the peanut butter. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. brains work so differently, and that's what makes us all great. But it's sometimes it's odd. <laughs> okay, so now you've made your peanut butter and jelly. You've got it mm -hmm. in front of you. Are you one of those people that's like, I'm just eating the whole thing? Or do you cut it in the following manner? Two rectangles or two triangles or four squares or four triangles? Wow, there are so many. I didn't know there that many options. Um. I, if I'm going to cut it, it's going to be triangle, two triangles, uh, but I'm not super rigid. I don't have to cut it, but if I am, it's going to be triangle. I'm a, I'm a four triangle guy. My mother did it for me as a kid and I've always treated it like tapas, like Spanish tapas. Like you get the little piece, you know, it makes me feel <laughs> fancy. <laughs> I'll have to try that too. <laughs> Is a hot dog, a sandwich or a taco? See, I don't think it's either. I think it's a hot dog. I think it, it lives in its own category. If it's going to be something, I guess sandwich if I have to choose, but I think it's its own. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Red velvet cake. Is that a real flavor or is it just chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom? The, the second one. It's just dressed up like chocolate or vanilla cake. I don't think it tastes like anything. I'm going to have frosting. I should just have crepe cake. That one's better. <laughs> yes. Yes. If we're going to have cream cheese frosting, it's going to be on carrot cake. Like, the spices, don't give the me nuts, that chocolate better. cake. Yep. You're going to give me chocolate cake <laughs> that you're going to upcharge me for red food dye. Get out of here. <laughs> you said carrot cake with nuts. What about with raisins? As long as it's not too many. I'm not a huge raisin person, but it works within a carrot cake. So yeah, it can be there. The golden ones are good too in carrot cake, I think. Yeah, they're very good in carrot cake. Okay. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh, that's hard. I love ice cream. It's one of my top two favorite foods. Uh, favorite flavor? A really good... Like a really good creamy strawberry and it's very classic but like a good strawberry is amazing like a really good like fruit vanilla ice cream do you want the sh like strawberry pieces in there too or just 
strawberry ice cream without the pieces of strawberry? I think the pieces, yeah. You said it's one of one of two of your favorite foods. What's the second favorite? The other one's just cheese, like any kind <laughs> of cheese. Any kind. <laughs> That's my number one favorite food is just any cheese you can find is great. And then ice cream. <laughs> we have hard hitting questions here, so you have to make a choice. You only can have one uh, variety of cheese for the rest of your life. Which one are you going with? It's got it. It's goat cheese. It's not the most practical, but it's my favorite. Like a creamy goat cheese is so good. <laughs> By the way, the comments on Instagram are flying through this conversation and they're fantastic. I feel like I'm going to be canceled for my food choices. <laughs> purely running. Uh, Lori's got yes uh, for creamy. She's called you that you're not a savage. I'm assuming that's based on how the, um, uh, the sandwich is put together. Double uh, <laughs> A Ron triathlon. I'm assuming it's Aaron triathlon. It, it's a hot dog and he's laughing about that comment. It's his own category. <laughs> he's all in on eat the sandwich whole. Um, he's clearly against candy corn. He oh. is all in on red licorice. Um, <laughs> and, and Lori has a question now too, which is are ice cream and cheese, the same food though, just in different variety, just in a different package. <laughs> I mean, I, sh no, no. I mean, yes. I, I see, I see the question. But like, no, they can't be the same. They're no. I don't know. I don't know why, but no. <laughs> so ice cream. Do you, so are you like all in on ice cream, or you're like, yeah, I'll have some gelato or sorbet too. Mm, gelato, yes. Sorbet, no. I'd rather just have like a fruit forward ice cream. It's not like creamy enough. It's got to be like really delicious. Soft serve ice cream. Great. Like, yeah, not sorbet. Meh. <laughs> you, are, you are my people. We're all <laughs> around this We're going to have to start our own food podcast at some Ooh, point. Absolutely. Candy, candy bar. Your favorite type of candy bar is? <sighs> mm. uh, would a Reese's count as a candy bar? Yeah. 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 Like Reese's cups then. So are you one of those people who's like, yeah, but I really love the Christmas tree or the jack-o'-lantern Reese's over the Reese's you get every day of the rest of the year? No, I think the everyday ones are actually better. I feel like the, the way they crinkle, like the outside is better. It's It works better with the, this is insane to say. It, it's better. The regular ones. <laughs> it's like a firmer chocolate and it's, it's better. <laughs> I stand by it. It cracks me up when people are like, no, the jack-o'-lantern is way better. I'm like, it's the same shit. What are you talking about? <laughs> Do you freeze the Reese's? Um, I've not frequently, but I've done that and that's good. I do freeze Thin Mints, like the Girl Scout cookies. Yes. Those are good in the freezer. That's, I always do that. I freeze one sleeve and I keep the other one unfrozen. I always pronounce him correctly, but the coconut one, I don't know if it's Samoas or Samosas mm, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, but I love those frozen too. Like, cause then as the, like, as it thaws out, that coconut hit is just unreal. <laughs> okay. Pumpkin spice or apple cider? We're getting close to fall. We're, we're creeping up on fall. So are you going pumpkin spice or apple cider? Apple cider. Yes. <laughs> I walked into the grocery store the other day and they had all the pumpkin shit out already. And I was like, come on, man. Oh. It's too soon. It's far too hot for that. It's just too warm for savory flavors like that right now. <laughs> so speaking of savory, Savory or sweet, you can only eat one variety of, of flavor for the rest of your life. Are you going savory meals only or sweet meals only? Oh, I, I'm inclined to say sweet because I'm definitely more of a sweet person than a savory person. But for the rest of my life, that's hard. I'm just going to stick with sweet. I'm not going to overthink it, but that the rest of my life thing definitely gave me pause. But let's go with sweet. <laughs> nice. So every morning it's like apple pie or like Lucky Charm cereal every morning, sweet. I guess now it sounds gross, but I guess that's what I'm going with, sure. I'm like, no, but okay, I said so. Lori has corrected us or corrected me and has said that the ratio of chocolate to peanut butter is different in those uh, special varieties of the jack-o'-lantern and, and Christmas tree and um, I do believe they have a heart-shaped 
Reese's uh, that comes out for Valentine's Day. And for those of you who don't know about this, go check out our Food Fight Friday that we did for Easter candies and Athletic Katie talked about this and it was hilarious. Okay, chocolate chip cookie or oatmeal raisin cookie? Chocolate chip, that's easy for me. Oh, Really? Yes. <laughs> Man, you were on a roll until then. <laughs> Chocolate chip cookie. So do you like going like chewy or do you go to that um, hard brick style like Chips Ahoy, that hard one that you got to dip in the in the liquid to soften it up? Mm, definitely chewy. Fresh baked or are you like, you know, I'll just get the Nestle package, cut up the cookie dough and drop it in the oven too? Uh, fresh baked, but I'm not a baker. So if someone will make me them, absolutely <laughs> that. <laughs> Pop tarts, frosted or unfrosted? Frosted for sure. Favorite flavor? Uh, I think just like frosted strawberry, classic, but but good. Not trying to do too much. <laughs> yeah, you're in on the strawberry here. Strawberry ice cream, strawberry <laughs> pop tarts. Yeah. <laughs> Last question for you. Brownies are baking. They're getting ready to come out of the oven. You can smell them. You know they're gonna be good. Are you going to the edge? So you get a little bit of crust or you go to the center and get the ooey gooey piece? Edge. A little bit of crust, but still like some gooey because it's sort of in the middle. Yeah, definitely edge. Are you putting nuts on your brownie? No, I, I would eat it, I guess, but no, better with that, I think. You're, a, you're an ice cream fan, even though you chose strawberry. I'm presuming strawberry doesn't go on top of your brownie. What flavor of ice cream would go on top of your brownie? I think just like a, like a classic vanilla, like a really good vanilla. Maybe there's some caramel in there, but yeah, a vanilla for sure. Are you a fan of coffee? Yes. Okay, so here's, here's what you need to do the next time somebody either bakes you brownies or Betty Crocker's coming out of the oven. <laughs> Take a piece of the brownie, put it in a coffee mug, then top it with coffee-flavored ice cream. And as you're eating it, you're essentially making a mocha. And as the, the chocolate melts, you end up with nothing more than what becomes an affogato at that point. And mm. it is phenomenal. It is the greatest thing since sliced bread. That, absolutely. I'm going to do the, the, the wheel of candy corn. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and then I'm going to make fancy tapas style peanut butter and jelly. I got so yes. many things to try. <laughs> My mother would be so happy to know that other people are joining in on the tapas, peanut butter, and jelly. Pinkies up eating, Sam. You gotta. It sounds fun. <laughs> Speaking, well, we mentioned bread earlier. So favorite uh, variety of bread, flavor of bread is? Mm. Uh, I really, I don't know if this is where exactly we're going, but it is bread. Um, like a rosemary focaccia is so good. Yeah. That like one. for me, there is none that are out. Right. Like I love bread. Like I could just all of it all the time. People laugh at me when I say, go to a bakery, grab yourself a walk around baguette. And they're like, what mm. the hell is a walk around baguette? And I'm like, you literally buy a baguette and then walk around the city eating it. Like <laughs> it's phenomenal. Can't go wrong. So I'm familiar with the concept, haven't tried it adding it to now my my list of things to do with food. your to-do <laughs> list besides running women and ultra running is like a mile long now with all the food choices we've discussed i'm excited <laughs> rachel thank you so much for joining me on our fireside chat it's been a blast talking with you we're looking forward to seeing women and ultra running grow and expand and knock down those barriers and obstacles and gatekeeping to get more and more women into the trail and ultra scene thank you so much for doing what you do Thank you. I really appreciate y'all having me on too. It, it really helps just to grow what we're doing. And I super appreciate you guys reaching out. This is a ton of fun. Awesome. Chat soon. Bye-bye.